the analogy used with my wife all the time is I feel like I'm strapped to the mast, you know, and the and the frigate is being blown around and I got to get off this frigate. Welcome to the Bulwark podcast. Every Thursday, we devote the podcast to the Trump trials, and there are so many of them. But this week, it feels like more like waiting for Godot. Um, we're waiting on Judge Ngorin, at least as we're recording this. We're waiting on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. We're waiting on Fonnie Willis to come up with her response. We're waiting on Judge Eileen Cannon to basically do anything. So we're kind of doing a lot of waiting, Ben. How are you, by we're, the way? Happy Thursday. Uh, happy Thursday to you, Charlie. And um and yeah, we're in the state of suspended animation, and um, it is uh, uh, aggravating. I got a, I got an email from one of your colleagues yesterday, which just had the sub subject line, "What's up with the DC Circuit?" Um, and I was like, I don't know. You know, uh, it's um, it, it's because frustrating. pretend to know. I mean, we have a podcast, so we're supposed to pretend to know, right? We're supposed you know, to say. I could speculate recklessly <laughs> yeah. about it. Um, look, my here's my reckless. Well, why reckless should you be any different? <laughs> here's my reckless speculation yeah. about it. You have two judges here who are from the liberal wing of the court. You have one who is from the conservative wing of the court. And so there's, I think, really two possibilities of what the holdup here is. One is trying to, uh, a, a very careful negotiation to keep the court unanimous uh, is one possibility. And the other possibility uh, is that Judge Henderson, Karen LaCraft Henderson, is writing either a lengthy dissent or a lengthy concurrence uh, that is and using a uh, taking quill her some can. time. Yes, yeah. and doing it in uh, a in a in a in a slow fashion. Dip, um, I dipping don't, it in I, ink. I honestly don't know which is more probable. Um, my impression from the oral arguments was that they were the three judges were not that far apart. Um, I did have the impression, based on the briefing schedule, that they were quite aware of. Uh, the time exigencies here, although, yeah. of course, nobody is allowed to speak the reasons for the time exigencies, but uh, that they were aware of them. And so I'm surprised by how long it's taking and uh, a little bit puzzled by it. Well, we're also waiting on uh, Judge uh, Ngoran, um, who was, uh, was had been widely expected to release that ruling in the New York fraud case yesterday. So, um can't really spend a lot of time on it because by the time this podcast comes out, we may know what he's he's doing. And again, it's all speculation. Um, he didn't meet his own deadline. There are kind of these new allegate these new you know accusations about deficiencies in the Trump Organization's financial reporting. Is that a possibility? Um, what's this all? I mean, this is the the, the Trump uh, the independent monitor uh, who was appointed back in 2022 flags this potentially significant irregularity in this report in the company. So could you kind of refresh yeah. people's memory what that might be? Well, so there is a uh, uh, an independent monitor who has been appointed to, you know, make sure that, uh, that assets are handled appropriately, given that the uh, attorney general, you know, w w is asking for a fine that would require a lot of their liquidation. And she's also asking for the business licenses of the relevant players to be revoked uh, or in some cases uh, uh, permanently and in some cases for lengthy periods of time. And so th there's some actor other than the current management of the Trump organization, which remember has been, people forget this, but convicted as an organization of criminal yeah. offenses, right? And and its chief operating officer has, or its chief financial officer has pled guilty. So, you know, there's this civil case Awkward. is only w one of their problems, right? And a lot of these assets at some point, uh, assuming these judgments stand up on appeal, are going to be uh, used to satisfy the judgment. And so there, the independent monitor is there to make sure that they are not liquidated and or mismanaged in the meantime. Hiding. And it, 
So, you know, that could be one of the explanations for the for the delay. The other explanation is more prosaic and probably explains the D.C. Circuit, too, which is writing good judicial opinions is actually hard and yeah. uh, sometimes takes a little longer than you want it to. And when you're dealing with a f- once and f- maybe future president of the United States, you do want to get it right and you do want to. Uh, uh, yeah. you know, particularly if you're going to take hundreds of millions of dollars of his assets away. So the stakes are a little bit lower for the D.C. Circuit, which is immediately going to get appealed and, you know, and is in any event not going to find determine whether Trump is guilty or not. But Judge Angoran is going to produce an opinion with a giant round number that says, you know, this is the amount of money that the state of New York gets from New York. And that's going to be a huge deal when when that number comes out. It's very likely to dwarf the eighty three million dollars that E. Jane Carroll got last week. And so, you know, you do want to be careful when you're writing that opinion, because you really don't want to be the judge schlub who gets who issues a, a big judgment and then gets no, reversed I, by the court. I, yeah, I think ab- applying, uh, you know, Occam's razor, these are the most obvious um, explanations is that they want to get this right. They want to make sure that it is ironclad. You know, they're looking over their shoulder for, the, you know, for the appeals courts and all of that. So that I think that seems reasonable. So there's really no point in speculating about it until it comes out. So I, I want to talk about um, the E. Jean Carroll verdict uh, coming down and, I have some questions to you about just about, you know, what's a lot of money uh, these <laughs> days and, you know, what what's enough money and what is actually real money? I actually have a reason for asking all this. But um, be- before we do that, I'm let, can we just, uh, just talk about the elephant in the room that, you know, that you and I have been doing this podcast for a long time. I've been doing it for, I said this morning, five years, actually, uh, this started off as the weekly standard daily podcast. So six years. And then if you add on a radio show that I used to do, you got another 23 years. And Ben, um, I blame you for this, that, uh, that I decided this was a good time to get off the daily hamster wheel of crazy and did announce that um, next Friday will be my last podcast. And I just wanted to mention that, at least at the top of this, in case people are tuning in. We're not done yet. We're going to do this podcast. I'm going to be doing podcasts next week. But I, th- I think it's I'm stepping back and I, I kind of blame you, Ben, for all this. Well, so I, uh, no, I, I, I'm no. not sure how I feel about being blamed for this. Um, uh, I, I did credit. tell you, I did tell you uh, a week or so ago that not having to have opinions when I left the Washington Post editorial page, uh, when I had to have opinions about every court opinion and I had to, and being able to decide what not to read was one of the most liberating experiences of my life. You did say that. that. I did say that, and I. But let the record reflect that I, in no way, knew at the time that you were contemplating stepping well, back. And had I known, I absolutely would not have said that because that encouraged you apparently to take this drastic step that I so regret. Uh, all jokes aside, um, Charlie, this podcast has been so meaningful to so many of us. And I say that as somebody who, uh, you. you know, most recently has been a, a participant in it on a weekly basis, but long before that was a regular listener and sometime uh, a person who appeared on it. I, um, It's one of the few podcasts I listen to absolutely every day, except when I'm on it. I know that there are, you know, just a gazillion people who have been moved by this kind of daily chronicle of the crazy and the your meditations on it and your conversations with people on it, both at the Weekly Standard and here. And I just want to say you. on behalf of all of them, how much we have valued your scurrying on the particular hamster wheel And uh, while we don't begrudge you getting off of it and having that moment of of absolute liberation where you don't have to uh, uh, probably only a uh, moment have opinions about everything anymore, uh, we will miss you very much and hope that we will get to continue to follow you in other forms.
Well, th- thank you. I really, really, really do appreciate that. And, you know, I, I really have enjoyed doing the podcast. As I, as I mentioned in my newsletter this morning, I had the opportunity to every day talk with, you know, the smartest people around, smart and interesting people, you know, and I was thinking back to when we first started this, if I'd made a list of the kinds of people that I want to talk about, I think I have most of them. I mean, I remember going to a conference um, in the before times, and I was thinking about, you know, there were a lot of interesting people there. I don't even think I've even told you this story. And I'm thinking, I've never met Ben Wittes. I really want to meet Ben Wittes. I wonder, you know, but Ben Wittes is over there somewhere. And I was thinking that how cool it would be. And here you and I, like we're, we're having these conversations. So I, I have been, you know, very, very honored, very, very blessed. But I think as part of Wait, what can I, I can, keep can thinking I just of, say, yeah. Can I just say about that, yeah. that that is one of the weird effects of the Trump era is mm. that it brought together all kinds of people who exactly. previously would have had no reason to interact with one another, not out of hostility or political tribalism. It's just that, you know, my world overlapped with with Bill's crystal's world enough that we knew each other by face and name and occasionally emailed, but not enough that I knew the Sarah Longwells or Tim Miller's or, Mm -hmm. uh, or Charlie Sykes's. Mm -hmm. Um, And the, you know, one of the oddities of the Trump era is that it caused uh, people across the political spectrum or including people like me who exist uneasily on the political spectrum to de- decide that their fundamental political identity was that they were pro-democracy and to put aside a lot of other things and bond on that basis. And no, I think, I think that's exactly that. right. No, I mean, and, it, it, and that has been an extraordinary experience. Um, you know, I can just name, you know, all the people that that we've, you know, made common cause with that we don't agree. And I agree with you. I, I'm also sort of uncertain on the political spectrum, you know, because a lot of this is, you know, broken, you know, old alliances and made you rethink various things, except about except about democracy. And I want to make it clear that I am not giving up the fight. I'm not walking away from this. Uh, one of my thoughts was, you know, you can't do this in the middle of the election year. And, and, you know, as I thought about it, I thought, no, th- that's a decision I've made for the last 40 years, you know, stick through the election year. But in, in, a, in this current environment, and I'm not saying that everybody else needs to make the same thing, the, the fire hose is a very real thing. And it is, imagine your brain being hooked into Twitter 24-7 and all of this stuff just going through. As, as somebody that, you know, I love history, American history, you and I have talked about that. I keep thinking that that you you're, you have a better perspective if you just step back, that when you are in the crazy every single day, you're not necessarily going to have the most important thoughts. You know, look, a lot of what we do is completely disposable anyway. But in order to understand our time, I don't think, you know, I mean, my life is getting up at 5 a.m. every morning and writing a 2000 word email and newsletter. And then getting on a podcast with really, really smart people. Now, I'm, I'm not complaining. That's hard. It's just that, am I doing the best possible job I can do? Am I contributing as much as I can? Am I fully understanding this extraordinary moment you're in? I mean, that that's really been the process that I've been yeah, going so, through. In so part. let me let me say for those uh, members of the audience who for whom that does not sound super hard, that's mm-hmm. super hard. Writing every day is hard and um having uh an hour of good questions having done enough reading to conduct an interview in a in a serious way across the range of subjects that you do it and then doing the uh political commentary that you do on television as well that that's a a hell of a grind to do week in day in day out week in week out month in year in and i i mean i've look i i wrote editorials for the post every day for 10 years i know the writing thing um every day but the writing and podcasting thing uh in combination that's a tough slog well and then there's another thing as well um you know I, i i thought obviously you know long and hard about how we got to this moment being how easy it is to get caught up in, you know, partisan or, you know, uh, cheerleading and tribalism. 
um, it happened. I got, I got, I got drawn into it, you know, back in the, what do you call them? The, you know, the, the aughts, whatever. Um, and, you know, we think about how when I was on a, in conservative talk radio and after a while, you know, it becomes about the team and you're not looking for, you're not thinking about things, you're looking for ammunition. And it's so easy to basically put on that jersey and feel that you have to advocate. I don't want to do that anymore. I, I, in, in, a, in an election year, I think it's harder and harder to maintain independence of thought and to step back and say, okay, what's really going on, as opposed to being right in the trenches where all you can see is the bayonet in front of you and the need for you to stick the bayonet in somebody else. And so I don't want to go from one sort of tribal, tribal mono thinking into another tribal mono thinking. I also think it's very, very difficult, Ben, to be a center right commentator in this particular moment because the right has become so corrupted it is gone it has been so subsumed with the demagoguery and hackery and everything and yet you know it's it's it, it's it's not enough to simply say okay i'm going to change my hat because i think we still need to talk to the voters who in fact are are confused by all of this, you know, and want to have trusted voices. So, so all of that is going on and I don't have a formula for it, but, um, back in 2016, when Trump came along, I realized I can't keep doing this. I can't keep, I can't be the, the analogy used with my wife all the time is I feel like I'm strapped to the mast, you know, and the, and the frigate is being blown around and I got to get off this frigate. Um, so I, I I felt in 2016 that that was the time to make to make a change, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. But I also feel that I can do, I I, I can engage in this fight in the long run more effectively um, by by not you know basically putting my face up against the fire hose. And 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 part of that is that 20, 2024 is not just about 2024. We have to sort of pace ourselves because this is going to be a fight that is going to last for a very, very long time, long after probably I'm gone. You're a young guy, but but for decades. And so I think it's important to maintain your independence, maintain your perspective, to be able to step back and maybe think things through as opposed to having an opinion on 20 things every morning to have an opinion on one thing, you know, for a while cumulatively, you will deal with all of the issues without driving yourself and everybody around you insane. <laughs> so Actually, I, I'm may, sorry. You, yeah. you may not deal with all the issues, and that's right. fine, right? You may yeah. deal with a narrow subset of the issues. Yeah. Um, so do you, uh, if we can switch roles here, and I can interview mm. you about this sure. for a minute, do, do you yeah. have a sense of what the, you know, on on next Friday is your last Bulwark podcast, which means I get to say one more. We'll be back next week and we'll do this all over yeah. again. But yeah. this is the last week I get to say it. Um, uh, what happens to you Monday, the Monday after that? You don't get up at five o'clock to write morning shots. What what are you going to be doing? What are you going to are you going to sleep in? Are you going to. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 work on a book. Mm. What's what's uh, what's the next? Uh, act? Well, 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 I don't know. Except that that, that Monday, um, the odds are that I'll probably have to get up at three forty-five to do Morning Joe. So I don't get to sleep <laughs> in. <laughs> That's the only thing. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but can we go back to blaming you for this? Uh, um, sure. Because the other thing that that you wrote that really sort of hit me was when you ran through the list of all the things that you don't care about. <laughs> uh, that I don't care because, you know, this is part of the thing as I'm realizing is that you get so overwhelmed with all the stuff you go, you know, I'm sorry, I just don't care enough to have an opinion about everything. And if, 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 I, if you step back and you, I guess, give yourself a little more time, you might, again, still not care or you might care about other things. But in answer to your question, um, I don't know. I don't think but, I, but, I, don't think I would but, care. But I'm, not, but I'm not leaving this fight. I just want you to know that. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Mm. Uh, I just want to say about that list that when I um, uh, wrote it, the I think the first item on the list is that I don't care who Taylor Swift is dating. Oh. And I have to say that the MAGA freak out about who Taylor Swift is dating and has made me uh, actually 
not care about it, but I've been so amused by how uh, angry people are at her uh, and how it's angry fun. people are about her that I've decided I'm just I'm a Swifty now. Um, OK, I'm, so I'm so I, I, I am I am with you on this. By the way, did you see the tweet? Because I thought this was really interesting this morning. Liz I did not. tweets to Taylor Swift, something like you are a national treasure. And I wrote the planets are aligning. Yeah, there's I mean, something going on. Ta- All Taylor's of these becoming, things are converging. Right? Taylor is inadvertently <laughs> becoming part of the democracy movement. Um, and well, I, and I have a lot of time for that. I have to see, look, I have, I have time for that as, as well, but it is interesting. You know, I mean, you know, we've talked about how, how the right wing has, has completely lost its mind. This is one of those extraordinary moments where even people on the right, I think are kind of going, maybe this is not the smartest thing. We have a new poll out showing Joe Biden has a six point lead now on Donald Trump. And a lot of it is the gender gap and the Republican party's response is yes, let's put Taylor Swift at the top of our enemies list. <laughs> Taylor Swift, there's Disney, um, right? Like we're 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 uh, the NFL. We're picking fights with pillars of American popular culture that are not obviously left aligned. Um, I, I mean, I I have not dug through Taylor Swift's music, um, but I don't think of her I've as seen the a concert. left. I, I don't think of her as left a left figure. Um, and, you know, she's not particularly political. And at some point, you're just not at yet. war with the culture. And when you go to war with the culture, you lose. Well, and you're going to war with the culture in a way that you're suddenly g- getting the attention of people who are not hardcore voters. You have a lot of sort of right. unmotivated, disconnected voters. And suddenly you're out there going, hey, you know, we are, you know, this is our jihad against Taylor Swift. And suddenly you get their attention, but in the way, in the worst possible, in the worst possible way. So see, Ben, you asked what I want to do. I want to write more about things like this, seriously. Um, but I want to do it in a more serious way. It's easy mm-hmm. to do the hot takes and the cheap shots, which I do not mind doing. I want to make this very clear. But, you know, for people who just listen to the podcast, there was a time in the before times when I actually wrote whole books. I've written nine books. I like long form journalism. I like writing columns that are thoughtful. Um, When I walk my dogs, you know, and listen to Audible. okay, I'm I'm, now I'm giving too much information. You know, by the way, I just finished a a Nathaniel Philbrick book about the Battle of Yorktown, which is just freaking fantastic. I mean, I don't know if you like what's it called just. It's called In the Eye of the Hurricane, I think. And it's about uh, George Washington and the French and everything. It's also very interesting, you know, having, you know, French grandchildren, you know, the detailed um, contribution of the French to the American Revolution, which I think people know about on a surface level, but it's really an extraordinary story. But anyway, but I also listen to, um, you know, uh, uh, the columns of, of Charles Krauthammer and George Will and the 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 sort of, it's now an anachronism to just listen to the thoughtfulness, the historical perspective, the, the, just the human decency in all of this, that this is the way conservatives used to sound. And it's like, it feels like it's a lost art, a lost art. It feels like an archeological dig in some sense that we're not doing all of that. And so I can, I actually love doing the, the daily short hits newsletter, but is it the, at the end of my career, at this moment, is that what I want to be doing? I'm sorry, there's too much about me. Um, but but if you want to no, talk about no, Taylor Swift more, I am more than into it. No, I, I am much more interested in you than I am in Taylor Swift. Mm. I, I've never written a, a line in an article, much less a lead, I don't care about Charlie Sykes. Um, but I have written that about Taylor Swift and her boyfriend, uh, which I slightly regret now. Well, you, you never knew. I mean, this is one of those things where eventually – all the planets will align that every single thing, everyone has to connect it in some way. What I love, by the way, particularly is the fact that now apparently if Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey are now coding as lib psyops, right? Does that mean that conservative MAGA America has to root for San Francisco to win the Super Bowl, <laughs> you know, you dig your you dig your own grave culturally, and uh, I think I think 
I think, yeah, they have to root against uh, the flyover state uh, and um, for San Francisco. And, you know, it's it's uh, MAGA <laughs> and Nancy tank. Pelosi. Yeah, you, you knew that they were taking a weird turn when when, when Ben Shapiro, um, you know, the the Voltaire of the right decided that he was going to, what you know, throw <laughs> Barbies in the trash because the movie Barbie was a thing. It's like you had really serious people at a really serious times. OK, so speaking of serious, let's talk about I want to talk about money, um, which I think you know a lot more about uh, than I do. So we found out yesterday, Donald Trump last year spent fifty five million dollars. Um, on legal bills, I guess my first point would be, you would think that if you had, you know, 50 plus million dollars to spend on lawyers, you'd get better lawyers than, than he's been getting. Uh, you, you would, you'd be able to get somebody other than, you know, Alina Haba, but that's a lot of money, isn't it? Yeah. So first of all, uh, let's be precise. Donald Trump did not spend $50 million Uh, on lawyers. Donald Trump's pack. Um, so. Which means Donald Trump's donors. Donors. Grandmas from Wichita. And why this is legal, I actually, you know, I'm the legal guy. I actually don't understand this. Um, why it is why it is okay to spend pack money on uh on personal legal bills that aren't obviously related to the campaign. Um I think the reason is has everything to do with whatever disclosures you make in the finest of fine print to uh to your donors but I am not a campaign finance law expert and I frankly find this bewildering that this is Interesting. that this is legal I mean this is a guy who is indicted I, on four separate occasions in his personal capacity, not in his, not for, you know, right. uh, uh, activity that the campaign obviously has some equity. In. And, and so I, I do find it strange. That said, the amount of money is very large and it's not that large for, you know, a, a defense in four separate high profile white collar criminal cases. Um, Plus, you know, two defamation lawsuits, plus, uh, you know, a couple of major um, uh, uh, civil suits. So I I don't think it's that surprising, given the magnitude of his legal problems, which are, you know, extraordinary. Um, That said, it's a very large amount of money. And if you are thinking of donating to Donald Trump's super PAC or uh, to the RNC, you should be aware that um, that these leadership PACs are actually spending an enormous amount of money on Trump's legal problems, not on you know getting him elected. His, his you donors know, I, may not care, but but you raise a very interesting question about the the use of campaign dollars because generally candidates that use campaign dollars for personal purposes uh, will find themselves in uh, in trouble. Well, as a general matter, yes. And the, um, I, I believe, but I'm not sure that the explanation is that what are called leadership PACs are not <laughs> limited to campaign spending. And, uh, they can basically spend money on stuff that as long as they are not, you know, defrauding anybody, they can spend money on personal expenses to the extent that they need to. That said, fifty million dollars—it's a heck of a gratuity. Okay, um, it is. and and I don't really—I don't actually understand also why it's not taxable income. Oh, that's another interesting question. Sure, yeah, that, that once it transfers, it transfers over. So I we're mean, not going to spend a lot of time. A, you you yeah. have a debt, yeah, mm-hmm. and it is satisfied by somebody else. Why right. is that not a gift? But I yes. look. I am not a tax expert, and I'm not a campaign finance expert. I I just don't understand why a giant bill um, for question. for legal fees uh, can be satisfied out of a do- out of donor pockets um, without raising significant legal issues. As to your question about the quality of his legal representation, it's exceedingly it's uneven. Easy. Alina Habo was a disaster in the civil case. Um, 
Uh, Mr. Sadow in Atlanta, uh, who represents him in the Fulton County case, uh, is not a disaster. He's a very professional, serious lawyer. Um, the team that represents him in D.C. has made some, I think, lousy arguments, but they are not incompetent. They're kind of loudmouth professionals. Um, and, you know, he has definitely not represented in most locations by the A-team. The, he doesn't have, you know, it used to be that he was represented by by Jones Day, uh, Don McGann and his crew. And, you know, they were there superb. Um, he's driven away all the normal lawyers and you're left with uh, these sole practitioners who are quite uneven in their quality. And some of them he fires very quickly when they... Uh, show any signs of independence or or being limited in the stupidity of the arguments that they're going to make. And so it's definitely going to be an issue for him as some of these cases head to trial. Uh, I don't know how much it cost him in the final judgment to have Alina Haba representing him, but, you know, that $83 million, I don't, I don't think it discounts all that much because the conduct is so horrible but um, but I do think it cost him real money not to have competent counsel there. Well, I mean, he, he, that obviously cost him a lot of money, um, but also his own performance in the courtroom. I mean, deciding to show up and in the, you know, in front of the jury, in the sight of the jury, you know, basically go and through huff. his performative asshole. Or, I mean, right. you know, for every moment that he was there, as I mentioned, I think, to Joe Klein on the podcast yesterday, look, it's not a surprise that Donald Trump has trouble getting good lawyers. I mean, he's notorious for not paying his lawyers. And now, in addition to possibly not being paid, um, you're watching lawyers being disbarred, <laughs> lawyers being indicted. Not a great incentive. So let's talk about that judgment, $83 million. You know, we're talking about what's a lot of money. Is, is $83 million, okay, we know that $83 million is a lot of money. Is it enough money to shut Donald Trump up? So far, he has not been redefaming E. Jean Carroll. So is $83 million, is that past the threshold of what it takes to get Donald Trump's attention? Well, at least for a week, right? It yeah. has his attention for a week. Um, he has not, at least not that I've seen, redefamed E. Jean Carroll in that time period. And uh, by the way, that's an interesting argument uh, that the judgment is reasonable. If you're you know, going to go up and ask that these punitive damages be cut, which I'm sure he will. Uh, one response to that is, hey, you know, nothing else worked. And boy, this jury said $83 million. And he's been awfully quiet in okay, response. So, so, oh, OK, so I have a question that that um, that you've sort of indirectly raised, though. So let's say that he has to post a bond or that he has to ultimately pay the $83 million. Can he take that from his campaign funds, his super PAC? He was asked so, about this the other day. Is that possible? He'd so want to, you know. The yeah. answer is I don't know. The the same, I, I think the answer is it depends on the specific fundraising appeals that the, um, that the super PAC purports to be, or the leadership PAC, but again, it, it raises potential tax implications. I think it raises campaign finance issues. But I think if you solicit money from people on the grounds that we're going to use this money to uh, pay legal bills and satisfy whatever judgments that we have, I think you probably can. But I, I oh, wow. again, it, requi it requires... Yeah a lot of knowledge of the details of right. what their fundraising appeals are, as well as what right. the bylaws of the organizations are. But I so don't just have. remind me, yeah. So remind me how this works. I mean, obviously he's going to appeal this, this judgment does, I mean, is E. Jean Carroll ever going to see this money? And number two, does he have to post a bond? I mean, you know, if you're Donald Trump, you know, when does it become real that you have to come up with $83 million and write a check to either E. Jean Carroll or into a, the, what, what is it? The, 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 you know, posted bond for the court. It's an escrow. It's a bond. Escrow. Basically. So, mm -hmm. so I, I, 
Yes, basically. And, and it's kind of real now. First of all, in New York, to appeal, the cost of the appeal bond, I believe, is 100 or 110 percent of the value of the judgment. And so oh, if you're really? going to appeal it, you actually do have to put up the money. Now, you can put up the money in either by writing a check that puts up the money or by hiring what amounts to a bail bondsman um, uh, to write the bond for you. And then you pay some fee right now. And they um, take the risk, right? Mm -hmm. They take the risk that you somehow run out on it, which mm -hmm. I, that I don't think he would be able to do right. because he has real assets in New York. So I like, he's got to put up real money now. Um, yeah, uh, interesting. The, the, the question is, and by the way, that would be, I believe, true of any judgment in the Angoran case as well, which would be, will be much larger. So you start to get into a position where it's not that he would, that she will not see the money to pending the appeal, but he has to make arrangements for that money to exist in real form. Um, and, you know, unlike Alex Jones, who can, you know, go through all kinds of uh, contortions to make himself judgment proof, Donald Trump owns buildings. You know, yeah. he owns the Trump Organization, um, which, uh, you know, has real estate and um, and he has golf courses. And so. I don't think it's that easy for him to evade judgments. That said, what he can do is scrape and fight and um, delay things over long periods of time. Okay, so let's talk about the, the, the big one that, that may come down by the time that people hear this. What should we be looking at in the Ngor in Judge Ngoran's um, uh, ruling in the New York fraud case? I mean, obviously, the top line is going to be the headline. Um, you know, it's going to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, uh, I believe Letitia James is asking for 370 million, you know, probably not going to be that much, but it's going to be a big number. What else should we be looking for? If you're Donald Trump, what's the, other than the money, which is, and that's a lot of money and that will get his attention. What other details in that ruling are you going to be looking at? So there's a few things that you always look for in a district court opinion. The first is, um, the findings of fact. When a court, a reviewing court reviews a lower court, they do not owe deference generally to the lower court on questions of law, but they do owe deference to the lower court on questions of fact. And the theory here is the trial judge is the one who looked, listened to the witness testimony himself, right? He's the one mm -hmm. who was up close to all the testimony, who heard all the all, all the backs and forths, and so when he finds something as a as a matter of fact, those will be overturned by a reviewing court only with a certain amount of hesitation. And mm. so, w when you're dealing with a district court um, uh, on a complex matter, you are always looking for do are the findings of fact rich. What are, you know, how did he do the work to document? People love to quote the, the highfalutin sentences and the rhetoric and the stuff, but look at the specific facts that he found. Did he, does he find as a matter of fact that like what, what value, what number does he put as a matter of fact on the total volume of fraud that the Trump organization committed in these valuations. Those are going to be very hard for appellate courts to, to overturn. Um, the second thing is there's the big top round number. How much of that is a, is the, the, the lost, you know, the, the value of the fraud and how mm -hmm. much of it is something else right whether uh whether punitive damages or or you know something that's more ethereal than you know you owed x and you did y right. right um and then finally what remedies does he uh, urge uh, does he order other than financial penalties so there's all kinds of requests here for like preventing 
the officers of this company from doing business in the state of New York, right? Preventing the, you know, essentially dismantling the Trump organization. Um, does, what does he do in that regard? Um, so the big headline will be the number, but I think you also want to look at what are the findings of fact that underlie that number and what are the findings, uh, what are the remedies other than that fine uh, uh, that what are the components of that gestalt number and what are the what are the remedies other than the financial remedies? OK, so let's talk about the, the other thing that we are waiting on. I'm not, we're not going to get to Eileen Cannon because we'd wait forever for that. I think yeah, we would come uh, the, the, three the, more the, months the, for that. I know the the Georgia case uh, D.A. down there, Fannie Willis and the special prosecutor, Nathan Wade, have been subpoenaed. Uh, to testify at a hearing in on February 15th involving uh, motions to disqualify them both from the Georgia election interference case. Um, now, this was obviously filed by an attorney representing one of the defendants in the racketeering case. And the allegations are that Willis and Wade were involved in an improper romantic relationship and should be disqualified. Wade had been expected to testify about his alleged relationship with Willis on Wednesday, but he and his estranged wife settled their their apparently rather nasty divorce case. Um, so we're waiting on her response. Um, where are her we response, at on this? How 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 right. grave a threat does this pose to the entire uh, election interference Trump case? So I am in the minority on this, and I don't think it's that serious a threat. Mm -hmm. um, here is the the parameters of the of the immediate issue. Uh, tomorrow, uh, by by Friday, uh, her response to this set of allegations is due in court. Now, it is possible that we won't see it tomorrow because a cyber attack has taken down the, the Fulton County court system's filing system. Uh, and Wonderful. so, you know, um, the docket is at least Yesterday, when I last checked, the docket was not available. I'm not sure whether it will be by Friday or not. But she will file her brief. And, you know, if by a uh, carrier pigeon, it will eventually make its way to the press and we will see a copy of it. And, of course, we will post a copy on Lawfare as soon as we have one. Uh, that will presumably respond at least to the legal argument that there is some conflict that requires disqualification here. But it also may respond to the factual uh, allegations. And the response on the factual allegations are is important because of two things. One is uh, assuming there was a relationship or is a relationship between Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade. Yeah. It actually matters when that relationship started. The allegations in the in the uh, um, uh, in the brief in the uh, contend that she hired somebody she was dating, and it seems to me it's a rather different picture if that specific allegation is true than if she hired Nathan Wade and then they started dating at some point. Right? right. That's a that's a bit of a different picture. The second area in which the facts really matter here is, is it clear that he's spending uh, money that he's earning from her office on her? her. Right. Um, is, and yes. that that's right. a much uglier picture if it's substantiable than if it's true. Uh, you know, if they've gone on a few vacations together and she's paid her way or he paid for the tickets and she paid for the, yeah. for, you know, the lavish dinners, whatever, I, I don't think... That's going to be a, um, you know, that's not going to kill a case. Um, the third issue and the really important issue is whether any of this creates a disqualifying conflict. Right. Um, and I suspect having looked at uh, or, or Anna Bauer uh, has looked carefully at the, you know, disqualifying uh, disqualification decisions in Georgia uh, it does not seem to me that these um, are rise to the level that have caused disqualifications in the past. Uh, that said, the tighter the relationship, uh, the financial relationship is with money that he is being paid by her office, the more that could change. And so 
what I would say is uh, this is an area where both the facts and the law argument in that brief that she's filing tomorrow are going to be really interesting and are going to matter a lot. And then the second uh, thing, I believe on the 15th of February, right, may have that date wrong, mm -hmm. is this hearing where they right. will both have to testify and uh, barring uh, something that I don't anticipate. And I, I do think that, you know, they will be, they will have to answer for, you know, less for the fact that they may be dating, which is not illegal. And uh, then mm -hmm. for any, any whiff that the, uh, that there is a financial advantage to her of retaining him for this work. Um, okay, I don't so, think yeah. that is going to kill the case. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll have to see what happens in, in mid month. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, obviously this doesn't look good. I mean, there's a lot of political fallout, but I, I want to keep on this whole question of, of, of killing the case. Let's say that in fact, their conduct did cross such a line that they are both disqualified from the case. Can the case survive in the worst case scenario of them both being disqualified? So if they were to both be disqualified, well, his disqualification doesn't matter very much. Right. Because he's, he's, he's an just, employee. He, he's an right. employee or actually a contractor. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if Nathan Wade gets disqualified, uh, um, Fonnie Willis has other trial lawyers and can hire uh, mm -hmm. other ones. Yeah. If she is disqualified, that is a big deal because her office gets disqualified with her. Oh, and oh it's not just her. It's the whole office. Yes, exactly. And so because the whole office okay. works for her. And okay. so if that were to happen, uh, that is a big deal. And that would mean that the uh, there's a, mm. a an office in Georgia that would then have to reassign the case to a different prosecutorial office, which would come in and uh, and represent the state for that for that purpose. That would be a big deal. Um, it would not immediately trigger the dismissal of the case. Um, it would require the appointment of a different prosecutor to handle the matter. And actually something similar happened Very interesting. Uh, earlier in during the special grand jury when Fonnie Willis went to or hosted a fundraiser for somebody who turned out to be running against the right. uh, lieutenant governor of the state, Burt Jones, and she was disqualified by uh, one of by the judge supervising the special grand jury from investigating uh, Burt Jones. And that case, to my knowledge, still has not been reassigned. So I think if she were disqualified, it would be a very big deal. It would not mean that the case goes away. It's an indicted case. But it would mean that you'd have to bring in some other office to take it over. And that would be given... Given the investment in this case, that would be a very substantial problem. Yeah, I mean, pretty, pretty obviously. So, leaving aside Eileen Cannon, um, what what else should we be paying attention to this next week? Well, uh, that's a global question. That could be that could be yeah, anything. Well, there's one big answer to this, which is one week from today, which is going to cause us to have to record at a different time than usual. Is the uh, the oral argument in uh, the Section 3 case before oh, wow. the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, there Definitely. have been 65 amicus briefs filed um, in the case. There is uh, a, I have a not lot of noise. I haven't read them all either. <laughs> but, you know, they're all available on Lawfare for anybody who wants them. You know, we are going to have a major Supreme Court showdown on whether... Colorado February eighth. Can, can whether Colorado mm. can bar President Trump from the ballot, and um, it's uh, it's your nightmare, Charlie. You've been you've been uh, warning about this um, uh, for like a year now. Yeah, February eighth. That's got to be on everybody's calendar. So um, yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be a long and busy busy day. So Ben, uh, once again, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Um, hey, this is the last time I podcast. get to. This is the last mm -hmm. time I get to say this. We'll be back next week. 
but not at the exact same time because there'll be an oral argument going on. And we'll do this all over again. We will indeed. And thank you all for listening to this Bulwark podcast. I'm very, very grateful. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again.